Hi everyone. Today I'm going to talk about AI and the advancements of AI and how it can elevate the user experience to a whole nother level. Now, before I start, let's get into the problem. Today, data has an extremely low quality out there when it comes to representing our titles. If we look at the movie Hacksaw Ridge here and the data that is available right now out there representing it, it's kind of silly. If we look at these words, hit by a brick, shot in the leg, these are the actual keywords that are out there describing this movie. And this is obviously not representative for the story of this movie. So AI have come so far that it understands storytelling. What I mean with that is that AI can actually predict the emotional structure of a movie. Now, I hope you guys have seen the movie Saving Private Ryan. There's the spoiler alerts. You had 22 years to actually see it. So I'm not going <laughs> to feel bad for spoiling it for you. But if you look at these graphs, on the top you see the positive and negative emotions of how we as humans would perceive this movie emotionally. In the middle, we can see the stress levels of Saving Pride Ryan and Black Hawk Down. Now, these movies are actually very close to each other if you look at the data. They're both about war. They are including soldiers. But if you look at the emotional structure, they're telling totally two different stories. If you look at the graph on the top, we can see Saving Pride Ryan starts quite stressfully. The stress is when they hit the beach of Normandy. It's perceived extremely negative. But then we have the middle of the movie where we have the character building. We create this emotional bond with each character. And then we have the climax of the movie in the end, where all of the characters we build relationships with dies. Now, Black Hawk Down, Ridley Scott wanted us to feel that emotional stress that soldiers felt on the battlefield. So if you look at the stress levels there, you can see it's basically mayhem through the whole movie. It's so stressful that you're almost attached to the seat. The camera's shaking, the music is stressful. These are telling two totally different type of stories. So just because they're about war doesn't mean they should be related to each other. A war movie can be gripping and inspiring, connecting to something else. Now, with this type of data, and remember, this is all automated and done by AI, we can actually start seeing how data is compared with each other when it comes to the keywords and the tags that they have. So that means that if we have a keyword like love for the movie Notebook, one of my favorite movies, you can see that, that that's a typical love story. We have, as you see, the value of love is 0.63 out of 1. That's extremely high if you compare it to the zookeeper's wife, which is, has the elements of love in the story, but it's not a love story. It's about a family that is uh, uh, occupied uh, during the World War II that opens a zoo, and it's more of an emotional story about sacrifice. So instead of just saying this movie is about love, you can actually now, with the help of AI, understand how much that keyword weights into that story. So if we look at these uh, two movies I just talked about, Black Hawk Down and uh, Saving Private Ryan, we can actually see in the data that one of them is a pure action movie. The green values that you see is what's very, very similar between these two movies. The yellow ones shows what not uh, similar keywords, but with different values. The red ones is what, where they differ. And you can see that Black Hawk Down is a pure action movie, and Saving Pride Ryan is more of a historical drama. One of them has a higher value when it comes to drama, which is Saving Private Ryan, and one of them has a higher value when it comes to intensity, how intense it is. So this is purely automated by AI today, and you can actually see that in the data that comes out from the AI. Now, with just the video file as the source, we can now start extracting a fingerprint for each file, video file that tells us the mood, the emotional structure of the movie. It actually can predict the genre, which is quite huge. A computer is watching a movie and telling us what genre it is fully automatically. It can actually predict the keywords that are relevant to the story, not just any random keywords that I showed you in the beginning of the slide. It actually takes relevant keywords, what we call video story descriptors. It actually can also predict where you should put ad breaks so you don't interrupt a very emotional scene or important scene. It puts ad breaks where you should have ad breaks in the story so it doesn't ruin the storytelling. It has what we call content embeddings, which is similar content, content that are emotionally similar to Hacks or Ridge, the movie. And it can also predict what we call benchmarkers. If it's a TV series, it can predict the intro, 
the recap and the end credits of a movie or a TV series. And it can, you can actually utilize that to either have the next episode button, or you can add uh, recommendations in the end when the movie ends instead of rolling the end credits. And it can generate preview clips, small scenes, that I think all of us have seen now on Netflix. As soon as you hover above an image, it starts rolling a clip. And it can generate tags to those small scenes. So we know that one scene is more joyful and the other scene is more uh, fearful, for example, or sad. Now, before I go further, remember, this is done by a computer. A computer is watching a movie and doing all of this automatically. That's how far AI have advanced today. Now, the reason I think this is important, just like I said in the beginning, is that today, if you work with the old type of metadata, you get stuck in a bubble. If I watch a sports movie, I'm stuck in that sports bubble. Just because I watched a movie race that is extremely emotional and inspiring, I would get a documentary about Ronaldo, for example. And that's where I think the bigger problem with internet is. You get stuck in these bubbles. But with this type of emotional data, you get very relevant and diverse results. A war movie doesn't need to be connected to another war movie. It can be connected to a biography about a musician. It can be another sports movie that is extremely inspiring. And you get this very relevant and diverse results, making sure that you don't get stuck in that bubble. With our partners at ContentVise, we actually could prove that with this type of data, we increased the accuracy of recommendations with 86% compared to old school metadata, which is huge. And the coverage of the actual library, because it's utilizing the video files, increased with 56%, which means that content that is usually hidden in the bottom of the library is now being uh, surfaced and part of the algorithm, part of the recommendations. Now, because we have emotional data, we can also elevate the user experience by generating what we call mood channels, where you can, instead of choosing that is a theme or a genre, you choose just what emotion you want to feel. I want to laugh today. I want to cry. I want to feel inspired. And then you basically start that channel and start consuming directly. Now, what we want to do is that we want to monetize uh, this also as well. So that's why ad breaks are extremely important. The ad breaks helps us to create these type of AVOD channels where you can actually monetize on them and put the ad breaks where it's relevant. And you can also create contextual advertisements. So you utilize the tags that I was talking about. So you put in a very joyful scene, or if I'm oh, sorry, if I'm watching a very sad scene that is quite low uh, tempo, you wouldn't want to throw me into a very intense commercial that is extremely loud. With this type of data, you can utilize that to actually uh, monetize that. Now, this type of channels, uh, I think you have seen everywhere. Not everywhere, but like Pluto TV and other type of services that has this. But you'd, usually they're very uh, based on themes. Like you have the sports channel, you have the music channel, et cetera. Now, the tags that I just mentioned is provided together with the ad breaks. So you can actually utilize that. And all of this data that I'm talking about, we're actually opening up right now. So we just launched a beta, what we call Global Fingerprint Platform. We have over 40,000 movies and 8,000 TV series with all of this data I just talked about. And I encourage you all to sign up for that beta. But before I end my presentation, I thought I would give you one sneak peek to something that is incredible, actually. That is that now AI can predict what we call content quality score. It actually can look at the movie and tell you the entertainment value of it. As you can see on the low rated side, it has a very clear pattern. You have all these B movies, anything with mega in the title, like mega piranha, mega shark versus uh, octopus, they all get very low ratings. But then you have the quality content. This can be utilized for contextual advertisement. I don't want my brand to be associated with a very low quality movie if I'm like BMW or Gucci or whatever. And you can actually utilize this to many, many other things, like recommendations or try to utilize to uh, provide a more personal experience. And that's all I had to say today. Thank you very much. Well, it's my first time at uh, NEM, 
and uh, I'm very excited to spend the next two days here with you. So, uh, lots of you here clearly are here to sell content, to buy content. Some of you have um, uh, directed to consumer services. And uh, it's very important to you to have good data on which you can make decisions. You can perhaps decide to produce the next type of content or buy new content, or you want to monitor the health of your service and you want to improve it. So today I want to talk to you about how Brykov can help you do that. So some of you may know Brykov, some of you may not, that's fair enough. So here are some numbers that describe our business. So Brykov started in 2004, uh, YouTube started in 2005, and we are an online video platform. You're clearly familiar with YouTube because they went B2C, so direct to the consumer. We are more of a B2B organization. And you see lots of video that uh, comes through our platform to you. For example, major broadcasters use us to power their long-form or short-form platforms. Some studios use us to sell content. And uh, some other services um, uh, use us for direct to consumer services. We also work for with the Academy. So people, uh, the members receive the titles to watch before the Oscars, and the Brykov is part of that platform that clearly needs to be highly secure. So one of the numbers that actually resonates with me is this one here. So Brykov delivers almost 1,000 years of video daily. And that is really testament to the scalability, the reliability and the accessibility of our platform given the scope of what we do. Now, what are the challenges that we help you address? Well, we clearly know that content is extremely expensive. So once you produce content or you buy content, you want to make sure you make the most out of it. And clearly, as an audience, you know, I'm part of the audience, uh, I have access to lots of subscription services. I also can find lots of free content. So it's uh, really key for whoever provides a service to make sure that uh, they acquire customers and they retain. And clearly, as a customer, I have the freedom and uh, I may not be loyal. So all these challenges is what our customers present to us and we help them address them. Specifically, on the content side, we help you maximize the value you get from this content by making sure it can reach different markets, different geographies, and uh, different devices. And uh, today, specifically, I want to talk to you about the audience insights that we have added to our platforms to give you some extra intelligence on which your decision teams can base their decisions to make sure that you know, the business is sustainable for the future. Now, historically, we have helped companies process content and deliver to the end users, so we take care of all that part. And then on the front end, we can help you create engaging experiences with your audience, no matter the monetization model. So you might have a subscription service or offer advertising. So these are our four areas of expertise. But specifically, when it comes to uh, audience insights that are really helpful, they are based on data. And the problem of data is that it can be in so many different places. Because you have people uh, reading the content on your website, watching content, uh, buying tickets, or responding to emails. So you have all these data, and it's oftentimes uh, difficult to consolidate in a single place so that you can actually, it can be human readable. And this means that oftentimes there is a gap between data and the decision teams. So how do we then help you this? So we help you, we have worked over the past two years to make sure that our platforms has analytics that can help you understand how to acquire content, uh, sorry, how to acquire an audience with thanks to your content, how to convert this audience 
to engage it, perhaps to save it from churning. So there is a whole life cycle that we can work with you on to really make sure that at each point you can make the best decisions. So when it comes to acquiring, we clearly uh, want you to design the most effective campaigns. And this is where, you know, most of the times, you know, the majority of your budget is put. It's uh, acquiring these customers. So uh, through the data you collect from the users, their behaviors, the data they give to you when you subscribe, you can collect a plethora of information on which you can base your campaigns. And for example, you can look at a cohort of long China customers, so customers that have been with you for, let's say, more than six months, and that engage with the platforms. And based on this cohort of people, you can build lookalike campaigns based on your data and feed this information to the likes uh, of Facebook or so Google and make sure you address people for whom the content you are promoting is relevant. We often find that uh, during the trial phase, uh, People, uh, companies don't really monitor the whole trial and how it ends. So it's very important to understand what content works to convert a customer and also to understand what doesn't work because sometimes the messages perhaps are not appropriate. So it's really key to make sure that the technology that you're working with uh, can monitor all these behaviors, put it into data that then are available to you. When then it comes to conversion, you can look at all the trialists that are uh, you know, uh, running a trial at the moment, and it's important to understand what uh, patterns they are showing. There can be, for example, stalled trialists, and uh, there it's very important to act quickly, to run some campaigns based on the information you have about them and making sure you engage them with relevant content. Uh, it's also important, as you monitor all these trials, to see which content is working. And we help you, you know, here you see these screenshots on the right-hand side on my slides. And this is all the information when you log into our platform. You can really see what content is working and converting your trialist. You may, for example, decide not to give them Game of Thrones, for example, because it's your pearl. But you might want to suggest a similar genre that can whet the appetite of your audience so that then they can subscribe and watch Game of Thrones. Uh, then, uh, because we work with so many customers, we also we see patterns and we advise people. And it's interesting to know when your trialists uh, do a trial on more than one device, they're actually 15% uh, more likely to convert into actual viewers. So this is the kind of work uh, we do with our customers. And, you know, I think you have gathered that with our platforms, you can collect all this data that is visualized on the right, and that enables to divide your audience into different segments and take different actions. Now, what we have done with our technology is to really devise some specific metrics. You know, uh, everyone talks about uh, uh, the number of views of a title, the size of the audience, but we look at the frequency. And based on the frequency, with which your uh, audience interacts with the content, we can suggest uh, different uh, approaches because you might not want to overwhelm, when, overwhelm them if you know they're faithful customers. When it comes to content, clearly you want to know what content is working well. And again, we have devised a number of parameters that can really help you understand how a certain content or a series is performing compared to others. So it's not only good to say X million viewers, but how is this content performing across your whole audience? And that's where, you know, we have come up with all these different metrics. And that they can be really interesting, for example, for your editorial and marketing teams, because if a certain audience has watched a big title, 
you might not want to advertise a very similar title. You might find perhaps what we call a hidden gem. The, and hidden gems are content with a high attention index, so when people are hooked, they watch, they binge on them. Maybe the audience is small, but they could sparkle the attention of someone who has already watched a big hit and perhaps maybe wander away. So at this point, you know, in this uh, audience lifetime journey, you can see we can help you with our technology to you know, collect all this information. And why do we do it ultimately? To make the work easier for you. So we want to make sure there are some elements of your activities that you can automate. So we can help you divide the audience into different cohorts based on what they have done, and then trigger some automatic actions. So, when, at some point, you might come to us and then ask us, well, uh, how am I doing? How am I doing compared to, to other people out there? And because we work with so many global brands, we have started benchmarking. Clearly, it's all anonymized. But you might have a feeling for you know, your churn rate. How is it compared to the rest of the industry? And again, at the beginning, I said there is a disconnect between data and decision team. So when the decision team decides to allocate resources for the next 12 months, it might be that churn is not actually a problem, so you are actually really in line with the best of the industry, but perhaps you might put your money and your resources on acquisition. So you can take a decision based on these benchmarks. And this is at a high level how we do it. So this shows the workflow starting from the left, from a plethora of data. As Brico, we have video views and we offer all those parameters, but there might be data coming from marketing, from other you know, providers of analytics. So we can take all that, we can harmonize that data. And that's the difficult part, because data you know, can be in different formats. So it's extremely important that we do 70% of the work, of the hard work, and then we present some graphs to you. And we know that looking at different type of customers, graphs are similar. The scores they want to look are similar. So you have access, you can vis see this information, and then your decision team can sit down, and then perhaps things about how to make content licensing more effective, how to reduce churn. So it's up to you to take action based on Brico Insights. That's my presentation for today. I think I was almost in the 12, 10 minutes. And I'm here with some colleagues, Chris Moore, uh, who will speak at the panel, and Tony Chan, our technical guy. So feel free to talk to us later. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Hidden Truths was a huge hit in Brazil. It was a top performing show, top performing novella, and it had traveled across the world. It was sold in 75 different markets. Uh, they re-released a new version, uh, a season two of Hidden Truths recently. And again, it was an amazing hit again, um, but they created this version to be very appropriate for digital channels, to be the OTT streaming version of Hidden Truths. Um, again, it took off and became top performing in Brazil, but then went across the world and started having traction in markets that it had never had before, uh, like Middle East and overall. The um, premiere was in October of 2020, and it was exclusive initially on Global Play. So again, it was created for Global Play, it was created for that digital platform. Uh, big hit overall. And the idea of telenovelas had always been that they would perform well in Latin America, um, and there had been crossover, and I think everyone knows that the uh, telenovela genre in general has performed well in Eastern Europe. Um, it's been crossing borders, but again, these new markets like Middle East are starting to pop. And Globo in general is producing products that are airing across all of Western Europe as well. It is a growing phenomenon that, again, content that was originally sort of thought for particular markets is starting to move in new directions. So let's take a quick trip around the world of content itself, and we'll focus in on a few different key markets. Uh, our company as a whole, again, starting from the basis of data, has been focused on uh, producing white papers and really starting to have thought leadership around the area of content. And this all comes from data that we're collecting through a consumer app. Um, the company itself, Whip Media, started out seven years ago as a company that was a consumer app designed to be a digital TV guide to capture information uh, for users of the app on content and where it was available across the world, as well as to give them recommendations about content they might watch. So not a streaming platform, but a place in which it becomes a utility for consumers to understand this increasingly chaotic world of content. So we're gathering all of that data, and we're gathering about 22 million, from 22 million people across the world in about 150 markets. It is billions of data pieces on TV and movie consumption. And again, as my um, friends who had just spoken a few minutes before were talking about, this information about audiences and about their preferences is vitally important to understanding what decisions to make into the future. So again, we're coming at it from the angle of consumers themselves from their own perspective, giving us information not only about viewing, but about, again, engagement and their interaction with content. Um, which allows us to develop this information about trends in, in the marketplace. So skipping over for a moment from Brazil to the European content landscape, there's been some really new things happening in the European market overall. And so we focused originally in one of our white papers on Western Europe and looked at Italy, Germany, UK, uh, and Spain and looked at overall what kinds of content was resonating and trends in that area. And it's interesting here just to see that US content continues to have a big place, but different markets are skewing in different directions. EMEA content or other European content is doing well in many of these markets, but Asian content, specifically from Korea and Japan, anime, uh, squid games, and other Korean dramas are starting to spike in these markets. And so the proportions of viewing are starting to change. Uh, local content. I've been hearing a lot as I've been at this conference about local content and the interest in having more local content, the European laws about requirements around uh, European content being shown in markets is all driving this. But again, audience preferences and the availability of content from other markets is changing the mix. The big epiphany, I think, for everyone has been that US content viewing is down. Um, this was the reason we wrote the, what, the white paper, is our own data was telling us that there had been a 10% decline in viewing of US originating content across Europe, across Latin America, and we're gonna see, because I'm gonna talk about it in a moment, Eastern Europe and the Balkans and Baltics in, specifically as well. So again, a dramatic change there is still a very high level of consumption of US content across the world, but the mix is incredibly changing. So 10% down in Europe overall, 
Honing in on particular markets, again, we're seeing some different changes. Spain, in general, uh, a market that was very focused on local content. So the increases that are happening that are taking the place of that 10% decrease in U.S. content consumption are happening from local Spanish content as well as other European content um, and even South Korean content. We know that Squid Games drove those numbers, but we had looked at other shows in Korea and, again, see that there is additional play with some of the other dramas coming out of South Korea that is driving those numbers overall. And again, here you've got Turkey, um, honorable mention as we say, Turkish content uh, has been traveling well for a long time uh, across LATAM as we know, but again in Spain, um, starting to take up you know, more space and be a bigger portion of that pie. Overall, Turkish dramas, um, particularly those with a romantic theme, have to, been gaining traction in Spain itself. Um, we do a lot of analysis of top 10 shows. We put out syndicated reports on that very topic. Um, but it's helpful to understand on a regular basis if these trends are changing, if things are shifting, what exactly is gaining traction in particular markets across the world. We also looked, again, specifically into LATAM itself. So you saw when we talked about Globo, when we talked about Hidden Truths, we're starting out with Brazil. Um, something interesting for us is that we did a kind of a deep dive on local Latin American markets and found that Turkish content itself is gaining traction overall. When you take out US and Japanese anime viewing from the picture and look at three markets, look at Mexico in particular, what you have is Turkey suddenly, Turkish content is at the same levels as three of the most primary Latin American countries in terms of consumption. So we've got Mexico, and I believe um, the numbers are small, that we have Argentina, Colombia, and I believe it was Brazil. There we go. Um, the Turkish content at 1.9% or almost 2% is at a level on par with content from those other countries in a Latin American territory. So super interesting that that's changing. Um, you've got some other shifts in Brazil and Argentina. Again, Turkish content is popping as at on par with other European content. 2% um, is considered a number that starts to spike. And this is recent information. This is from the last uh, 12 months. And it's uh, an epiphany that, you know, on par with content, um, other telenovelas, et cetera, in the market, that that content is popping. So in general, diverse sourcing for content is taking root and has been taking root for a long time. And Netflix has been a leader here. We've done some analysis on both Netflix and Amazon in the past. But here we're, uh, we're looking really specifically here at the market of Poland. In this particular market, um, you look at a three-year shift. You look at a three-year change. And US content, the big blue circle, half, you know, almost taking up the entire pie, um, is where we were at. In Poland, U.S. consumption or consumption of U.S. originating content is down by almost 20% over a three-year period. So they got the 10% overall in Europe, and you've got a 20% decline here. Again, here, lots of diversification, lots of new kinds of content coming into the picture from other parts of the world. So again, just another illustration of what's happening overall. And shifting in more specifically to a set of markets across this general region, um, we looked at you know, a combination of markets for the Balkans. We looked at Hungary. We looked at um, Turkey and Poland and Romania specifically. And I think, again, here you see US content consumption continues to dominate. That's not, that's not different anywhere else. I mean, it's still the lion's share. But it's a shrinking pool. And there is increases in other areas. So European content itself is the biggest pie, piece of the pie. And you have APEC. You still have Korea, and you still have Japan showing up here. Um, so super different, again, across time. The big change across these markets that resulted in what we just saw is that continuation in those markets of the decline of US content consumption. So big shifts, big blue bar going down. 10% overall across these markets. Um, and why that's important, again, is that it makes a difference. If we're thinking about content and we're thinking about what we need to license and we're thinking about our platforms and what to put on the platforms, we're thinking about the deals that need to get made. Um, a very different picture. 
um, the power is shifting in a sense. And there's much more uh, you know, ability to think about a broader spectrum of content and what appeals to audiences, but also a much bigger need to understand uh, the audiences themselves. So as a company, as I said in the beginning, you know, our goal is to have our finger on the pulse of the trends uh, from a sort of what we offer to the world of content, to the world of buyers of content and sellers of content, producers of content, is a couple of different things that we feel are an epiphany. One is that we have the consumer data coming out of this app um, that's collecting data across these 22 million people in the world. And that data is on a regular basis being refreshed, giving us information about content that's coming out um, every week. We, are, have, we have that data, we have the ability to dig in and understand engagement with content, to understand these trends, to understand what's happening. On top of that, we've built an AI-powered model called the Demand Score, which takes all of this data about engagement with content and the trends in content and territory-specific information, combines it with data on transactions, views, rents, and buys, puts that all together to allow us to predict performance of content in a particular territory in a particular, on a particular platform. Uh, and with that, we've developed the WIP Media Exchange, which is a um, first of its kind uh, data-driven licensing platform, uh, the WIP Media Exchange, which was launched in its beta state about a year and a half ago. And we are now um, in the market working with clients who are using this platform to both understand these trends, to think about how this data can help them make better decisions, uh, smarter decisions about content and about licensing, and then ultimately to allow them to start to negotiate and do the deals to connect with new partners in these territories across the world to understand how to make the best decisions overall. So thank you. <laughs>